Okay, hi guys. So, um, the last video we saw, well, we kind of stated that um, we're breaking V up into subspaces where T minus lambda, like in, in this subspace, T minus lambda 1 to the M1 is really 0. So we might as well just work on that subspace alone. So we're just going to, without loss of generality, we're going to assume that T satisfies an equation like T minus lambda to the power M equals 0. And um, actually, we can go further than that. Instead of looking at T minus lambda, we can just suppose that we're we'll just replace, you know, uh, we can look at like T prime. If we replace T with T minus lambda, then we can suppose without loss of generality that T to the M equals 0 for some M. So um, if T from V to V is a linear operator, we call it nilpotent. If t to the m is 0 for some m, well, okay, sorry, not greater than or equal to 0, for some m bigger than or equal to 1. Okay. So that's what it means to be nilpotent. And our goal is to understand um, kind of the structure of a nilpotent linear transformation. Okay. And the key is these things called cyclic subspaces. Um, after this, this is like the next video in this series, we want to understand um, like the matrix of a nilpotent linear operator. But for now, um, kind of the key to, to these things is to construct these cyclic subspaces. So what does that mean? Okay, so we have a nilpotent linear operator, T, and we have a vector V such that t to the m of v equals zero, like for example, maybe t to the m is just a zero transformation, but t to the m minus one of v is non-zero. Okay, so in that case, we call we take um, the span of v, t of v, t squared of v, all the way up to t to the m minus one of v, throw that in a subspace, call that u, and we call that u a cyclic subspace. Okay, because all it is is you take v, and powers of t and like throw them all together in linear combinations. Okay. And notice this is also this is uh, this is inv an invariant subspace as well and all that kind of nice stuff. Okay. And then if we do that, we call v a cyclic vector and we write c of v instead of u. Okay. So c of v is like. Um, the, the stuff that you get when you apply like powers of t to v and like combine them in all possible ways. So notice in particular if, if, if we have a cyclic subspace, if we have a cyclic vector then we have that c of v is like c0 v is a set of all things like c0 v plus c1 t of v all the way up to cm minus 1 to the m minus 1 of v, which we can rewrite that as a polynomial c1 plus c0 plus c1x, or sorry, c1 t plus, da, 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 plus cm minus 1 to the tm minus 1 of v, and this is, we can rewrite this as a polynomial p of t of v. Okay. So all the things in the cyclic subspace are look like some polynomial p of t applied at v. Okay, and so really the key is, is that everything in the cyclic subspace you get from v just by applying polynomials of t. Okay. Um, and our first proposition is that if we have a cyclic subspace it look like a cyclic vector v, then these elements, they form a basis for u, or a basis for c of v. Okay. Clearly, by definition, they span. That's what we call, that's what we put in the definition, is that they automatically, like, they span. But um, the, this proposition says that they're also linearly independent, so that they're a basis. Okay. So let's suppose we have... Um, that, that we have some equation, zero is some linear combination of v combined with t's, right? So like c0v plus c1t of v, 
da 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 plus cn minus 1 t to the m minus 1 of e. And that's 0. And all we do is we apply t to the m minus 1 of both. We apply t to the m minus 1. Okay, so our first term will be c0 t to the m minus 1 of v. Then we get c, c1 t to the m of v. Well, t to the m of v is 0. Right? Um, the next term is c2 t to the m plus 1 of v. That's 0. All the rest are 0. The only thing that's left is c0 t to the m minus 1. Okay, so we get um, c0 t to the m minus 1 of v equals 0. But and also our, our definition was that t to the m minus 1 of v is non-zero. So c0 times a non-zero vector gives you 0. That means the scalar has to be 0. Okay, so c0 equals 0. So now we look back at our equation, and we can just forget about this c0 v. And the rest is c1 t of v plus da da da, da plus c m minus 1 t to the m minus 1 of v. We just do the same thing, except now just apply t to the m minus 2 to both sides. You get c1 t to the m minus 1 of v plus c2 t to the m of v. Plus da da da, and those are all zero. Everything from this point on is zero. So what you get is c1 t to the m minus 1 of v equals zero, telling you that c1 equals zero. Now you sub that back into the original equation. Um, now you have an equation like c2 t squared of v plus da 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 da. da and you use that to show that c2 equals 0. And you go step by step, eventually showing that cm minus 1 is 0. All the coefficients are 0, um, telling you that this equation only has a trivial solution, c0, c1, all 0. In particular, these vectors are linearly independent. That's what we wanted to show. OK, so um, in the next video, I'll just give you a preview. We want to show that every, if we have a nilpotent linear operator on a finite dimensional vector space, then the vector space is the direct sum of cyclic subspaces. Okay. Um, so let me stop the video here and then do this in, in, in a different one.